and it's good to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, Frank Harmon from North Carolina and others here in Charlotte, uh, excuse me, in, in, in Atlanta, and some students that uh, we toured the Center for Civil and Human Rights earlier today, and so we've uh, had an ongoing discussion practically all afternoon. Um, and I have colleagues from Perkins and Will here as well, so thank you for coming. I want to tell you a little bit about our firm in the background because it relates to how we approach our work. Um, and starting the Freeline Group 25 years ago as one person, um, I tried to build on the experience from the prior uh, decade of working for other firms. And that means working in the public sector. Uh, we, we did um, work for colleges and universities, but starting first with K through 12. And the measure for us was at the end of the day was the project uh, contributing to the, uh, to the society in general or the community in a positive way. And if the answer was yes, then we were interested in the project. If it was no, then we, we didn't bother with it. So uh, therefore, we, we never did any prisons or um, strip shopping centers or casinos. Not that there's anything wrong with, with, with those, but it didn't really meet our mission and vision. And as we came in to, uh, to join with Perkins and Will, there was a, uh, a commonality of um, you know, our goals and vision for what a practice could be. So we continue in that vein. Um, and it's also very collaborative practice. The work I'm showing you tonight is not singular of, of my hand. Uh, it's work that is uh, being contributed to and, and worked on and collaborated with uh, uh, across the firm. From the youngest um, of our staff to, to the oldest, the ideas can come from anywhere. We value diversity because if we all came from the same school or the same town or um, had the same background, we don't think the solutions would be anywhere near as vibrant. Um, and so that, that is uh, how our practice began and it continues uh, in, in the format of being Perkins and Wills North Carolina practice. And you know, let, let's start with a, a small project, a, a very small one from some time ago, the Museum of the African Diaspora. And we were hired, as we often are, to uh, do the programming and help the institution figure out what it wants to be. So uh, even before it was named this or this was their mission, we help them figure out through community engagement how this development project that had a social and community uh, and cultural component, how that would be uh, integrated into the building, but what, the, what would the theme be? And so if we believe that the African diaspora affords us an amazing opportunity to show the interconnectedness of all people, and this is from the fundraising uh, booklet that we worked on with Sussman Prasia out of Culver City, and when you look at the child's face, um, and you read this line, if Africa is the cradle of humanity, then each of us is part of the story of the African diaspora. There's a mirror panel in the book, and, and so you, you're seeing yourself and realizing that we're all part of, of uh, the human community. The site, very prominent, the Yerba Buena section of San Francisco 20 years ago was basically Skid Row, and the redevelopment agency uh, slowly has brought this back to a point where it's a, a, a jewel in there. Uh, city um, and our corner uh, of third and mission is right next to the uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and it's part of a larger development here. This is an SOM tower, uh, the St. Regis Museum uh, Hotel um, and part of the development deal was to have this cultural component 20,000 square feet across three floors. This is Yerba Buena Gardens, uh, the metronome, Metreon, Riverwayna Center for the Arts, Visual and Performing Arts, and uh, Mario Bota's SF MoMA. And if looking at it from the uh, Third Street side, we can see part of the MoMA here. Um, but it's a, a handsome uh, SOM building. Uh, part of it was a historical building here, the Williams Building. And looking at it from Mission, we had our own entrance and own architectural expression uh, to the three floors portions of three floors of that tower. And so as a departure point, we took the angle, uh, the entry angle, and, and decided to make an intervention here uh, to distinguish this place from any other uh, sort of retail or office establishment along Mission, um, and to distinguish that with this canopy that blasts through the curtain wall and, and create some color and take that uh, cranked angle and start our planning from that. One of the challenges here was 
dealing with these huge columns that are holding up the 42-story tower above and sort of ruining the, the light, uh, potentially um, airy feeling of that jewel box. So we decided to cover the columns um, and use, use the stair as part of the story. And so the constituent images that build up to the child's face have this read from a distance, but as you're on the stair, it begins to tell the story of the African diaspora through imagery, but also sound uh, coming through the wall. And the architecture uh, becomes the first uh, exhibit. And moving from one floor to the next uh, is an ascension that is, is part of that, that experience. Uh, the stair is very light. It's um, cantilevered steel plates, uh, no, no cables or columns. So it's a, it's a very uh, visually light structure. And it begins to engage and tell the story even from a distance, um, welcoming you in to the museum. In Greensboro, um, we were hired to uh, commemorate the International Civil Rights Center and Museum. And this particular project, the building itself was the artifact. This is the Woolworths building where the sit-ins took place in 1960. Uh, four freshmen from North Carolina a State University um, came and, and sat in. Uh, and so restoring the building and part of the imagery and, and infrastructure was, was part of it too. And so uh, you know, bringing the Art Deco facade back, the uh, sign was contributed by Woolworths. Uh, and on the interior, um, working carefully to blend uh, some contemporary expressions with the historic uh, interior structure as well. And that movement down into the space by way of an escalator begins the process of, of uh, working you through the exhibits uh, that are down below um, in a controlled environment. And then at the very end of, of this visitor experience, you, you come to the top again, and the actual lunch counter where the sit-ins took place is restored but it's infused with uh, technology and, and um, uh, video uh, stories that, that help to recreate what happened during that time from various perspectives. And so the, the architecture itself uh, is the artifact in this case, both the exterior and the interior. This is moving two at a time, so I'm gonna back up a bit. This is Charlotte, North Carolina. The Harvey Gantt Center for African American History and Culture um, is situated at a point in town um, just south of the CBD. This is the banking center of the southeast, uh, Charlotte. Here's your NBA arena, your NFL arena. Um, you have the uh, convention center here and a new development, uh, mixed use, that was coming up. And our clients were given um, we were given a number of sites to analyze with our clients. We felt that being in the cultural district, this new district that was coming up uh, in this zone of the city, this green area represents what was called the Brooklyn neighborhood. Back during segregation, uh, in the South in particular, um, there were standalone communities that had their own uh, schools, you know, hotels, theaters, et cetera. And it's all gone now. Um, typically, two things happen. The, the freeway blast through, uh, but then on the plus side, integration means that you no longer need all these separate facilities. But we wanted to find a way to commemorate that. This is the zone where that neighborhood had existed, uh, and this is the cultural district that overlays that. And so we, we see the Beckler Museum by Mario Bolta is finished here, the Mint Museum by Machado and Silvetti, that mixed use block here uh, by TVS. Um, includes retail, hotel, uh, residential, office. The convention center's here, Paycob Freed's NASCAR Museum is close by. And so we liked being, the possibility of being in a vibrant cultural district. The, the problem was it, it was a very difficult site. There were other sites that had more contiguous property. This site was 55 feet by 400 feet. And so, <laughs> You can imagine our clients were saying, you know, why are we getting the short end of the stick once again? You know, here we are with, the, with this throwaway site. You can't be serious. And I said, well, give us a weekend to, to do some 
conceptualizing about this, we, we think that being in this uh, zone with the other cultural institutions would be a tremendous uh, boost for, for the center. Um, and they, they allowed us to, um, to explore possibilities here. This is the section, and the reason that site is 400 feet by 55 feet is it's an access ramp for cars and trucks to 10 stories of parking below the tower. All right, and so cars come in at one level at the end, excuse me, trucks, and then cars come in at a parallel ramp above it, and, um, and the site behind it is a future development site, so you really can't expand that way. Back to the neighborhood. We, during our research, and, and quite often we start projects by exploring the history of, of what's going on there, and we found this, this vibrant standalone community with uh, professionals and, and their own um, institutions and so on. And this one particular uh, photograph intrigued us. We found out this was called the Meyer School. It was nicknamed the Jacob's Ladder School, uh, partly for the biblical reference, but also during uh, celebrations and graduations, folks would come out for photographs on, on the stairs and, and you know, signifying that education was a path to advancement, particularly during segregation days. And so that was one idea we wanted to explore, Jacob's Ladder. And then we also looked at uh, quilting patterns and the tradition across the country and across cultures, but particularly in the African-American community of quilting and making something out of nothing, and, and, and uh, African textile patterns, uh, and the fact that we had this site that was nothing. What could we make out of it? How can we patch something together that was vibrant uh, and relevant? And so our, our part T became the elevation. Uh, Jacob's Ladder, the building had to be picked up because there were two ramps below it, uh, and then the patterning, the stitching pattern of uh, suggesting quilting around the building. So what do you do with a 55 by 400 foot building? Well, here's the truck ramp at one end and the car ramp comes in the middle and turns down. And so you enter at the ends. This is escalators up and stairs up at the other end. And then on that party wall, where this is a future development site, you begin to organize things like toilets and elevators and mechanical equipment at that wall, four hour wall where you cannot have windows. And as you arrive at the top of the escalators and the stairs, that's your, your lobby space. And it's shown here with the banquet configuration. You have a multi-purpose room. Again, uh, exit stairs, elevators, toilets, et cetera. Uh, classroom uh, and your first gallery space. And one of the advantages of, of coming up and arriving at the center of the building is that at the third level where, where your full galleries are located, you don't have any corridors to take you there. You're already uh, in the center of the building and can enter immediately into the major gallery spaces and pick up a couple of feet of cantilever. So even though you're in a long, skinny building, your primary exhibit spaces are, um, the aspect ratio is, is quite right. Then at the top, there is a, uh, a rooftop deck um, and you have administrative offices, classroom, and again, your support facilities along the party wall. And so looking across the freeway amidst the other, the, the TVS tower and the other cultural institutions I mentioned, you know, we have this very prominent um, image of the Gantt Center with the atrium, Jacob's Ladder expressed, and then the stitching pattern uh, that we used for the high-tech grain screen perforated uh, metal panel. So here's the, the entry at one end. Um, cars go in here, it's fairly well disguised. As you can begin to see here, the entrance and exits for the cars right in the middle of our building. And then looking back up the street toward the tower. And then on, on the rear of the building, uh, we continued that pattern, that motif uh, of stitching, and created a very inexpensive light sculpture there. And uh, one of my, my friends and, and, um, who's an architect and one of the expensive condos looking out on this site was after me during construction, telling me it better look good because I would look at that every day. And he, he gave me the thumbs up after this was done. 
That was uh, David Furman, um, who's a prominent architect in Charlotte. And this is at the top of Jacob's Ladder at one of the entrances into uh, the gallery spaces. So that atrium comes up. Um, and you, you continue with that idea of the ladder. Some of the, the folding of the ceiling planes is reminiscent of what we're doing on the elevation. And then at the top floor, there's some uh, gathering spaces that uh, are used for revenue generating um, activities and rental. This is the sloped uh, glass from the outside and from the inside. Uh, and it's been quite successful. Uh, people didn't want to believe you could do anything with that site. We felt like we were in the right place and were able to, um, with the client's help, deliver a successful project. And in the galleries, you wouldn't know that you're in this long, skinny building. Another civil rights uh, project right here in Atlanta the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, and some of the students who we toured today, uh, the center, um, there'll be some of a repeat, but I've got some new slides as well. And here, uh, our research led to a, a familiar uh, set of images, this notion of in interlocking arms. And as you've seen with uh, some of our other work, we feel that it's important, especially in cultural facilities, for the building to help tell the story, for the building to convey the mission and vision of the institution and, and uh, to be fully integrated with exhibitry. And so this idea of uh, interlocking arms was something that intrigued us. It, we felt that it, it was expressive of uh, people from different cultures and age groups uh, getting together for a common cause, Dr. King. And even today as we, geez, this is moving fast, um, we see that that's an enduring notion of, of interlocking arms, uh, even as we look around the world as uh, human rights issues are, are prominent. And coming down here to uh, present the scheme, this was what I found in, in the newspaper the, on the airplane. And uh, I said to myself, well, we picked the right, this is a good sign. <laughs> we have the right idea. Um, and during the presentation in a room something like this, I asked everyone to stand up and link arms and actually feel the power of, of that, that, uh, that idea. Very collaborative. Um, here tonight is uh, Herman Howard. Herman, where are you in here? There he is. Also, Nik Nikia Strong was on the team as well. Um, and as with all our work, we, we charrette. Uh, this is Gio Obata, uh, who participated in, in the charrettes uh, to see, you know, what can we do with this idea of interlocking arms? And just building models and sketching the old-fashioned way, but also you know, using some technology and laser cutting to, to explore uh, options. The site is on the corner of Ivan Allen Boulevard and Centennial Olympic Parkway. This is the, the block that houses the um, Georgia Aquarium and the world of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola owns the site and donated that, that quadrant to this project. Here's uh, Centennial Olympic Park, the convention center, um, and so it's, a, it's an interesting and intriguing site. You can begin to see two arms interlocking here in this scheme. This was an international design competition. And we were one of five finalists that included firms like Dillish Graffitio, um, Paycob Freed, uh, Norman Foster, et cetera. When we won the competition, people wanted to know, well, who's Freelon? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they kind of found out after that. Um, <laughs> And this is, a, this is another uh, instance where being in the midst of other cultural institutions was a good thing uh, with the aquarium here. This is called Pemberton Place, which is a, uh, a grass uh, plaza area and the circulation from these buildings, we benefit from that. And this elevation is about 20 feet above that corner. So we've got opportunity for on-grade entrance of two levels. Uh, this scheme, uh, the competition winning scheme featured uh, two arms interlocking with cantilevers at both ends in an interior courtyard. Um, this is a slide I didn't show the students before, but this is a view as you're walking from Ivan Allen Boulevard up to the courtyard and then a grand stair back up to the entrance at this end. Um, and I'm breezing through this because the building doesn't look like this. Those, those of you who've been to it. And there's a good reason for that. <clears throat> this is a model we built. 
And one of the things we did with the board is uh, we, we gave them a memento of our presentation that included a, uh, an acrylic uh, three-dimensional model of, of this, this scheme, you know, the interlocking arms. And uh, that, I think that was another thing that, that um, resonated with them. Now, that building was programmed to be 93,000 square feet plus or minus. And, you know, we were on point with that. Uh, and um, this was in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, and we all know what happened around that time. It was a very tough recession, the beginning of recession. And, you know, donations kind of dried up, commitments to fund the project were not as firm as they had been. And we were asked by the board to reduce the size of the building from uh, down to 61,000 square feet. And we said, okay, uh, instead of a courtyard, let's bring the arms together. They're touching now. There's a, a lobby uh, at that intersection point. You still have the expression of the two arms. Um, we went through up to design development on this scheme and uh, felt pretty good about it. We, we thought that it, it would be a handsome building. It was designed for a terracotta rain screen. Um, fit very well on the site. And who can guess what happens next? <laughs> the project went on hold for a year. We were asked to reduce the size from 61 to 43,000 square feet, less than half of where we started. Um, and the team was kind of upset about it. And I, I said, you know, let's take this as an opportunity to, to make an even better project. I'm not sure I believed that at the time, but that was my pep talk. <laughs> and, and so we did. We rolled our sleeves up and said, you know, what are we going to do? And back to the arms. I mean, you can only reduce arms so much, and pretty soon you end up with an alligator or, or, or a Tyrannosaurus Rex with these little stubby arms. So we said, Let, let's maybe step away from the arm idea, okay? Um, and we started thinking about how the, the building in a reduced footprint really began to open up the site more, you know, and that a smaller building really needed more verticality to it, right, to have a presence on this site. And, and we started thinking about the site as a space for action. And, you know, in this country and abroad, you know, places like the National Mall, Tiananmen Square, or Arab Spring, these are areas where the outside opportunities for that kind of expression are really important. And as our building began to compress a bit, it opened up opportunities for us to explore that notion of a space for action, really utilizing the site in a more powerful way. And so our, our building then is still caressing the content more like hands than arms, let's say. But it, 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 it's, it's not literal. It, it's very subtle. It's uh, subliminal. But we're using the site then as this place for action with a plaza at the upper half and also at the lower half, where, where your children and, and buttons of, of tourists will come at, at, from this direction. Others who are already on the site are coming from above. But then there's this moment of grand stairway that leads you around that curve and then a cascading uh, landscape next to it uh, for outdoor activities and a very gracious way to connect the two plazas. And we did bunches of studies. I was telling the students that uh, we use conventional model building, uh, blending that with laser cutting and so on to, to really uh, explore these shapes. Uh, many iterations of how those, those walls should be formed and what angle and you know, what proportion, you know, how we're going to step around the site. The patterning, color, materiality, uh, studies uh, of all of this, um, fenestration. Much of the building doesn't want or need or require light. It's controlled uh, exhibits that, um, that are relying on technology. But you do need light in, in places uh, like some offices that we have uh, and also stairwells. So um, we see that there's uh, patterns there. And we, and we do use computer rendering, not so much to give a, uh, a photorealistic interpretation, but to give a sense of what the interior spaces would be. And with a south-facing lobby, uh, controlling the, the, the glare and the heat gain was very important. And this, uh, we do from time to time, the 
photorealistic flashy renderings, and this is one from an aerial view. And so this is the building uh, as it stands today. Um, the south facade, uh, very transparent, welcoming people in from Pemberton Place. The uh, aquarium would be over my left shoulder. World of Coca-Cola would be over here. And then the stairway moving around the building as well. This is uh, what you see when you come in, exhibitry front and center, um, you know, radiating out from the lobby into Pemberton Place. And if you were standing here, this is what you would see on the upper level, the expression of that fenestration pattern on the inside. And moving vertically, similar to other projects we've talked about, is important uh, not to just get in an elevator, but make that ascension um, a, an experience and something that is uh, memorable, moving from the lower level to the middle level. And here's that movement uh, outside around the building with the cascading landscape and the monumental stair that, that connects the two lobbies and gets you close to the facade. It begins to frame you know, views of, of downtown. A, um, a water sculpture was commissioned for this project. We work with uh, the artist on that as well. A couple of libraries um, in Washington, D.C., uh, this is the, the Northeast, and we were hired by the library um, system to do two branch libraries. Exact same program, but very different locations and communities. Tenley Friendship, affluent uh, Northeast, within walking distance of American University. And you know, studying the, the patterns uh, there, the urban fabric, uh, the local character, and so on, you can see the diagrams. Um, and we were really at the convergence here at Wisconsin and Albemarle Avenue of, of all of these vectors um, from the LaFont plan uh, on up into the Northeast and a very constricted site of building out to the boundaries. And so we, we, we took those vectors as the uh, form giver to the floor plan, um, picking up on a bit of a pinwheel uh, idea or parti and creating a, a um, atrium here on the west no, no windows. Again, it's a party wall situation. So we put uh, you know, support areas there. I don't know why this is jumping so quickly. All right, and so um, at the street level, uh, we, we, we picked up the sun control uh, fins to give uh, more transparency and access uh, to the pedestrian directly into the building. The, uh, those fins are perforated. We studied, studied the uh, amount of light that can come in and still allow for a nice level of natural light without the glare. The ceiling has absolutely no fixtures in it. It's all indirect, indirect light. And here's the atrium uh, that brings you from the stair and brings light down into the belly of the building. We call the plan. This is Albemarle Street and the atrium there. Exact same program opposite end of the city. This is the southeast, the traditional African-American neighborhood called Anacostia, um, but a different site, quite different. Um, this is the figure ground showing commercial, <coughs> uh, but transitioning quickly into residential, and our site is right at the knuckle here. And even though it was a bigger site, we couldn't build on this area because the temporary uh, facility was there and had to be open until it moved here. There were legacy trees, and so we were forced into this uh, orientation with a long western facade and also a bigger building uh, at the 22,000 square foot range. We wanted to break that down into pavilions to be more consistent with the residential scale of the neighboring community. And so the, the, the Part T is this roof form that folds down to protect the western facade, and then the pavilions are sitting on a plinth. And it's a green roof, <clears throat> and it's a green roof. <laughs> uh, and to give a, a moment of verticality, th this uh, beacon uh, lights up at night in such a low and long building. Um, from the inside, you can see how the roof turning down and the, the shading uh, effect of that right at the horizon line on the west. Um, very simple plan with the reading room uh, with sk skylights coming through and sort of main street that brings you uh, along the building. And again, that, that roof turning down to protect the western facade. Now, also in Washington, right in the middle of the Monumental Corps, um, the team of Freelon Ajay Bond and the Smith Group 
uh, won an international competition once again. Um, and I understand David Ajay was here a couple of years ago. He's been great to work with. He's the lead designer. Uh, we hold the contract, the Freeline Group does, with the Smithsonian. And so the team is FABS, Freeline Ajay Bond and, and the Smith Group. The site couldn't be more important and prominent. Five acres right on the corner of Constitution Avenue, 14th and 15th, Madison Drive, um, literally in the shadow of the Washington Monument. And it's another one of these hinge sites where you, you're moving from the orthogonal grid of the mall to the more uh, free-flowing, organic, you call it nature of the Washington Monument grounds. And we're right there at the knuckle with views from and to the major monuments uh, close by, the White House, Archives, Capitol, the Jefferson Memorial, ML King Memorial here, the uh, Flecking Pond, Lincoln Memorial and the, the uh, Washington. And so our building um, needed to respect its very important neighbors in, in this prominent location. And the regulatory gauntlet you have to go through to please so many different constituencies was just, just incredible. <coughs> Everything from the Secret Service to the National Capital Planning Commission, to the Commission of Fine Arts, uh, I'm on that body now. Um, and neighbor, neighborhoods and save the mall committee and you know it goes on and on. <laughs> and so we, we, we kept the building um, in a very simple square in the footprint relating to its, its neighbors, right? And then the landscape is picking up on the curved, uh, curvilinear nature of the grounds in the, around the Washington Monument. So in that way we're, we're blending that moment where the two intersect. Some of the research here and the ideas um, come from Yoruban architecture in West Africa. This is called a karyatid, and it's similar in, in form and concept to the Western column. You know, there's a base, there's a body, and there's a capital. All right, in this case, the capital is, is this crown uh, form, or corona, we call it. And uh, you know, there, there are examples of this in, in West African architecture. And so let's keep that in mind as we talk about the concept. Also, the, the idea of celebration was important to the director, uh, to us as architects, that the building should be, um, yes, it should house those difficult stories and tell the truth, but it should be a, as much about uh, celebration as it is about, say, victims and perpetrators. That's not the, the seminal story. And so you know, this upward motion and form of celebration is something to keep in mind. Also, the porch, uh, particularly prominent in the South, is a welcoming expression. It's a place to see and be seen. It's a way to extend the landscape into the building and the building out of the landscape and, and create this threshold and welcoming visitor experience. So all those things were drivers in the development of this scheme. And David's uh, sketches um, cueing on this idea of the corona and how it could be um, it was protector of the precious content inside, hand-drawn and during charrettes that we had held together. And so the building is, is a corona with a front porch spanning 240 feet clear. Um, and the corona is, uh, is clad in a bronze-type material, and the openings in the corona are variable, um, allowing different levels of light to come through, different views, framing different views to the monuments <coughs> and controlling uh, heat gain and light coming into the building and giving us this form. And that angle is 17 and a half degrees, which is the angle of the capstone of the Washington Monument, another subtle, subtle reference right there. That's also 17 and a half degrees. And so that porch is creating almost a, a microclimate of cool air coming off a reflecting pool and, and we want this to be a, uh, a place for everyone, not just about and for African Americans, but uh, as Lonnie Bunch says, our director, the African American story is the quintessential American story of, um, of lifting oneself up and becoming successful. The, the main hall uh, is this constellation of timbers uh, that's lit from above, that at once is, is this sort of magnificent uh, spectacle, but also is beginning to to communicate the gravity and the, and the weight of, 
of the uh, exhibits above. Half of the building is below ground, and so we, we were very careful to bring light down into the building at the top of the corona tiers. Uh, this is one level down. There are major artifacts there that were building the building around. For instance, a Pullman train car was lowered into place about a year ago, and, and the history gallery is being built around it. There'll be a Tuskegee Airman aircraft there as well. And then there's this commemorative space that is intended to give respite after perhaps looking at difficult exhibits, um, you know, to come and, and reflect on what you saw. And, and water being uh, expressive of um, rejuvenation, spirituality, cleansing. The model, uh, where you can see how uh, light is being brought down through the top of the corona tiers and then the variable perforations in the corona. And so the, the ironwork, again, more research. We looked at places like Charleston, Atlanta, uh, Savannah, New Orleans, and much of the ornate iron, ironwork was done by freed or enslaved Africans and African Americans. Uh, and and that, those, those beautiful florets and patterns, we have given a, a, a computer interpretation of those to create the pattern of the corona, you know, a modern interpretation those patterns. And by variegating the, the amount of light that comes through, we're able to, as I said before, privilege certain views out of the building and control the light. This is a full-scale mock-up of the corona that was built in Pennsylvania. This is one of the three tiers, so the building continues up three times this height from that point. Um, but obviously we wanted to make sure it performed um, with regard to the envelope uh, keeping water out, uh, but also to look at the views through the corona, uh, the nighttime uh, at, uh, aspect of it, where it's going to glow to a certain extent during the evening. And we're under construction. This photo is actually a couple months old. Uh, you're beginning to see, if you go there now, the truss work that um, outlines the three tiers of, of the corona. Glass is being put in place. And um, this is the oculus uh, moment where I showed you the contemplative uh, water coming through. And this is the view from the top of the building um, where the offices and uh, boardroom and so on will have spectacular views across Washington. I'm going to end with a, with a competition that we recently uh, submitted. And this was for the Shraman South Asian Museum and Learning Center Foundation in Dallas, Texas. And I got a call from the uh, patron person who has, has the money to build this because he had seen our work, some of it you saw tonight, many others that you haven't seen, where um, he was interested in you know, having a building that was expressive of the South Asian culture. I'm talking about India and the surrounding countries. And, uh, and so we talked about it. Uh, he's invited six architects. We presented fifth in that group, and we're waiting to hear back from it. But I thought I would show you uh, a little bit more about our process and, and how we approached uh, this particular potential client. It's about five and a half acres <clears throat> in downtown Dallas. This is the Ion Pays Tower here. And it's really at a moment where you transition from the CBD and the um, cultural district, other museums at this end, to more of a uh, pedestrian-oriented uh, part of the city here. The Perot Museum by Monfosis is here, and you, you access it below the freeway. So there's this connection uh, between the CBD work, the arts district, play, we call it. That's, there are other institutions there, museums. And then uh, there's lots of new residences near the Perot. And so we saw this site as a, as a critical uh, area to, to link those together. And we did three schemes. They asked for three ideas. And I was explaining to the students that competitions are tough because you're working in a, in a vacuum. You don't have the benefit of getting input from uh, you know, your clients. So you have to kind of go on your own. And we did lots of research here um, about the South Asian culture. And so the first scheme was about absence, the space in between buildings, the spaces that are empty, 
uh, and we wrote a design approach, a design statement for each of the three schemes. And I won't get into the detail here, um, except to say that, you know, the path toward enlightenment often flows through those, uh, those spaces in between. And if you look at the program and you begin to uh, connect through the program, um, and you remember the site diagram, it, it begins to uh, define the different areas of the city and bring prominence to that that intersection and the flow through uh, perhaps three separate buildings that could be attached with bridges if we get to that point. And there's precedent for these tight, you know, urban spaces in in the uh, South Asian environment, certainly, but also in more contemporary expressions of, of that form and how the landscape would work um, as we preserve most of the, the land for future development. And as you approach uh, the three pieces of the building, here, here, here are those, that canyon, if you will, that, that tight uh, space between buildings. And we're, sent, we're standing at the center of that where we have choices uh, to go over to the Perot or through to the Arts District or back to downtown. And you know, in a very uh, quick study of the architectural treatment, um, understanding this is a competition, we would have more time to develop it. But this would be the view from the freeway. And it was important to the client to know that um, on day one, you might have your, your museum and center, but there is a landscape that could be populated with future buildings as well. The second scheme was about the lotus, and the idea that the lotus plant that you see above the water is one thing, but there's all this structure and earth and support below, um, and how this idea was central to uh, the, the South Asian culture and to express that architecturally was something we wanted to do with the second scheme. So the program is divided among two buildings, but in the center we have that jewel, that lotus plant that floats on a body of water, but you access it from below. And some precedents for the, the jewel box approach, the Apple stores, the uh, Louvre Museum, um, and the grove of trees uh, in a very, very regular pattern and uh, the step wells that we see in uh, South Asian culture that go down to the content. And some landscape precedents there. So you, you ramp down, there's that, that jewel here, but you access the museum at the bottom of the ramp and you look up and you can look through the water um, to that, that architectural element. And the, two, the program is split between these two buildings that have different functions. And there you are at the bottom of the ramp there would be special exhibits in that, that particular aspect and a view from the highway. And finally, the interconnectivity and the um, icon of the continuous knot is another um, cultural uh, reference point for us. And uh, that complexity and interconnectedness is, is an important concept in, in South Asian culture. So the program then becomes these pieces that are interconnected and instead of putting a building in the garden, we're putting a garden in a building uh, where the, the courtyard is the primary interior function, some uh, historical precedents for courtyards but also contemporary. And then wrapping the building in a pattern, this is taken from the Taj Mahal, but giving meaning to the screening device by using patterns that are specific to the culture and landscape precedents. And so the building, this is the most compact of the three schemes. And if you can imagine uh, this scrim or uh, veil with the patterning uh, that's appropriate to the culture. And then um, you're looking through the pavilions that, that sort of mimic the, the scale and size and shape and looking across the courtyard back out into the landscape. So we're waiting to hear about this. We we're very excited, but I thought it was a good example of, uh, once again, of how we try and do the research and imbue the architecture with meaning that is specific to the client's mission and vision. Um, and this was presented in a very small group. So we, we built these boxes. Each of them had the logo of the scheme. And we opened the box and present those same drawings on these cards um, you know, one at a time. Yeah. 
with the uh, day one development and then future development. Each of the schemes had their own box, and we presented that as a gift to the client. And uh, we'll see what happens. That's Perkins of Will, North Carolina. Thank you for listening, and perhaps there are a few questions I'd, I'll try and answer. Them. Yes. So it seems like um, a topic that's been very popular in recent years in architecture has been human resilience. Yes. I think your projects really speak to cultural resilience. Um, can you speak a little bit uh, more about architecture as an agent of, of that? Yes. Um, I think one, one reason I, I didn't stress uh, sustainability and resiliency is that that is a common theme to all that we do. It's, it's no longer a feature or a special aspect um, of, of what we do as architects. And so trying to conserve the land, for instance, in, in Dallas to, to build on one section or another and, and uh, try and concentrate the building rather than spreading it out over a broader area is one, one way that we're, we're trying to practice resiliency. and. You know, these are our concepts, and so uh, if we're selected, we look forward to developing the schemes in a, in a much more deliberate uh, way to address issues such as resiliency in, in cities as well. So um, today's discussion was more about concept and I generating an idea that's expressive of the mission and vision of the institution. Well, that's yeah. sort of what I'm getting at. Is yeah. like the cultural resilience aspect of what you're right. doing. Well, we what think it's projects you work on? yes. We think it's really important to remember, you know, uh, in, in in the case of some of the civil rights museums uh, and the one on the Mall, National Museum of African American History and Culture, to uh, commemorate those moments uh, and, and make sure that that people celebrate those and understand the history uh, and learn from that and, and look toward the future. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, Frank, did you? Have I was asked that question earlier today, and um, the, the question was, what advice would I give to a young architect? Uh, and I gave some advice about interviewing. <laughs> I told them to be um, enthusiastic and to be prepared to talk about the thinking behind the drawings and, and models and, and schemes that they show. Uh, and I think that it really does require a commitment. I think all the students here have already demonstrated a commitment to the profession. And that, that is really what the start of it and what is required to get through the education, the internship, licensure. It's a long path. Um, but my advice is to stay with it, enjoy the, enjoy the journey. It gets better. It gets fun. It's, it's, it's a tremendous profession. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have done it any other way. And uh, I've, I've told the students I feel like I was born to be an architect. And if you feel that way, too, then you're on the right path. I saw a hand go up back there. Was that an amen to born to be an architect? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes? Um, your presence has played a critical role in the development of your projects and the communication of your precedent and the final design is very well executed, but where do you start with your precedents? Do you do a community overlay and say, okay, this is what they need in that area, or is it the program of what the client wants and you look for key points in that? Uh, the question is about precedents and how do we get that information. Um, we do research that's independent of discussions with the client, you know, just to try and inform our own <coughs> investigations. And I talked about this to the students earlier today. Um, we engage the community where these buildings are built. We didn't talk much about that tonight. We did this afternoon with the students. And that means, um, you know, getting uh, residents and other interested parties involved in the design process, and not just on a perfunctory way. Uh, but actually engaging them early on and bringing them back. And oftentimes there are, are strong ideas that come out of that kind of engagement. But more importantly, there's a sense of, um, of buy-in uh, and uh, you know, support for community-based type projects. And so it's important. For the Smithsonian, we did a national tour uh, to eight major cities and, and got people to, to uh, submit ideas. And so this notion of, of participatory design is really important uh, for us. 
not that you're going to incorporate every idea or um, that it's a democratic process. It's not. We're professionals. We, we make choices. Uh, but people want to be involved, and, and we get a lot out of those sort of interactions. Yes? Well, Bill, you've done a number of competitions, and we all know to uh, prepare for an interview is an extensive composition. What sort of stipend you know, is associated with some of those competitions? <coughs> what sort of stipend? Yeah, they, they vary. There was a stipend for, for the South Asian, um, and I'd say it covers maybe 20% of what you spend. Um, and I see the other professionals nodding their heads. Um, and so we, we had a really good run. I think for, um, for the National Center for Civil and Human Rights and then the Smithsonian, you know, we, we were selected within a month for those two projects. And then we went like two or three years without, without winning one. So it, it kind of averages out. And the other thing that we do is we make sure that um, you know, we have better than an even chance. So if we know something, if there's a relationship with the potential client or uh, we have expertise that other firms don't, you know, we want to make sure that we, we're not just throwing our hat in the ring with 10,000 other architects on an international competition. We want to be invited, you know, which is most of these were, were that way. Uh, and if we're not invited, if, if it's a wide open competition, we want to feel like we have um, you know, some specialty, specialty or, or um, uh, visibility in a way that the client would notice us and, and, and you know, pay attention. So it's not, it's not just, um, you know, picking this one or that one. We, we're very deliberate about a go-no-go -no -go decision on competitions uh, to try and position ourselves to, to win as many as we can. Yes. Yes. Okay. So how do you distinguish working from the, in the public realm from the private? I, I've talked a lot about um, user engagement, community engagement. That's a distinguishing characteristic. Low budgets, that's a distinguishing <laughs> <laughs> in the public realm, you know, sadly. Uh, you know, but the buildings we showed, with the, with the exception of the Smithsonian, were all built on very modest budgets. Okay. And so that's something that we're, we're proud of. Um, and, you know, Educating people, whether it's a library or a university building or a museum that, that is enlightening folks to different cultures and, and, and different uh, historical events, uh, those are all good reasons for us to, to participate in, in the public realm. Uh, now, what's different about the private sector is that oftentimes if you're working with a CEO, you know, he doesn't have to answer to the community, uh, he or she. Um, there isn't necessarily a, a need to um, involve other people. And we've had a few, like we don't work very often in the private sector, but uh, there, there are advantages to, to knowing a decision maker, not having a multi-headed client. There's, there could be one person or three people in a committee. You know, they're, they're, you can get to a, an answer maybe quick, more quickly. Um, and so, but you know, we chose to work in the, in the private, in the public sector for all the reasons we talked about. We want to make a positive difference, not just on the bottom line of a, of a CEO's balance sheet, but in the lives of everyday people. You know, I could show bus stations and you know, uh, uh, human services complexes that, that serve the very needy in, in these communities. Trying to provide beautiful spaces for those folks makes us feel great about being architects. In the back, yes? Well, um, I spoke about this earlier, the collaborative process. Um, and, you know, you don't wake up one day and you work for the Smithsonian. It, it, started, with, uh, <laughs> it started with small projects. I, I remember uh, at my alma mater, North Carolina State University, right, and they, they were renovating, this was like 20 years ago, their African American Cultural Center. Well, it wasn't a new building. It was in a corner of the existing uh, student center. 
you know, but that, we did it, and it was in our portfolio, and that led to something else, and so it's very gradual, um, you know, 25 years, uh, and so it, it's, it's just, um, you know, keep having a vision for what you want to do, and then expressing that to the per people you work with. So that's going to attract certain people to your firm. Others that want to do something else can measure against what we say we want to do and either come join us or not. And we make choices about who we hire. Uh, and then, um, you know, when you have that common commonality of thought uh, and goals, then you're surrounded by like-minded people, but diverse in, in the sense that we come from different backgrounds. And the collaborative process that I spoke of earlier, it really is the fuel that, that, that drives our, our design work. That we have you know, talented people uh, working together. Yes, right behind me, the last question. Okay, uh, I have some, first of all, a great presentation. Thank My you. name is Martin the Oklahoma Boy, and I noticed that um, a lot of your projects are inspired by traditional African culture and aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, in the case of the African American Museum, you know, that 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 that, that kind of makes sense. And um, the cell, I think, is is in you know the process. Um, I think clients are intrigued by how we do our work, right? And so, if you can communicate that and involve them, then it's not so much a sale as it is you know bringing people along and and, and engaging them in the process. So you know we don't go off in a corner and then come and, and, and unveil some masterpiece and try and sell it. It's 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 more organic than that. I mean it's a it's a um, iterative process that involves not just us but the, the clients and users and community as well. And so you know communicating in that way and you know garnering trust, right? I mean that that's one of the keys I think is uh, our clients tend to trust our judgment and, and listen and, and because we're listening carefully and aggressively we can show them that this is what we heard and how it influenced the design and so forth so that's the kind of process we use very good question maybe one more and we can wrap up yes sir That's a great, great question. Um, I, I do have free time, and what I do, since, since um, architecture is so collaborative in the way that we do it, what I spend my free time is doing something I can do by myself, and that's photography. You know? and, and I think there's a link between photography and architecture that I do a lecture about that, not tonight. Um, I'll give you a little taste. Well, if architecture begins with a blank sheet of paper, or, or a blank screen on your computer, and you kind of build up to something uh, that is, is, is evolving and becomes this complex thing. Uh, photography, in my mind, is the opposite. You start with everything, you know, uh, the, the whole world, and you make choices, and you narrow it down to a very narrow slice of time, very narrow slice of time, and your own particular perspective. So there are choices that you make uh, to, to uh, go at it from the opposite direction as you do from architecture. So I, I like going out, not photographing, you know, none of these photographs are mine. I photograph landscapes and, you know, the, the relationship of the natural and built environment <coughs> is an ongoing theme for me. I've exhibited, um, you know, one man shows and I've uh, taught photography at the college level. So that, that's one of the things I do. And I go fishing, that's another sort of solitary thing that I do. So I'm, I'm involved with all these other people all the time and so quiet moments, I, I do those things that are more solitary. And um, unless there's another burning question, perhaps I should bring it to a close. There's a gentleman with his hand up. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm from D.C. and I grew up with Kim Smith's one of my brothers, African family, my wife was from Congo. And so the various serving job or visionaries of the mall, you know, growing up. Yes.
Well, there, there, there are open spaces uh, and, and major public spaces in the building. Uh, but remember, we, we, we work very hard to integrate exhibitry and the building. So it's not two different things. And so uh, Ralph Applebaum is the exhibit designer. And they were brought on board very early on. And in fact, we, we made adjustments to the architecture based on a good idea that he had about the uh, history exhibit. And so uh, that collaboration I talked about in museum work especially includes the exhibit designer who's a partner with you, or should be, as opposed to you know, just designing an envelope for exhibits and they go in and make it work later. And so I feel like we've been um, very cognizant of, of the notion that these spaces aren't just open spaces in a building. They're, they're going to be expressive uh, and help the exhibit flow and back and forth between the architecture, the artifacts, the um, high-tech exhibits, you know, and so on. So yes, there, there was a deliberate attempt to integrate all of that and thereby making the interior, you know, even more important than the, than the outside. That's where the content is, right? And that's where the stories reside. And so the, the, a lot of attention was given to that. So with that, I, I want to thank you all for having me here, and I appreciate it.